So, hello everyone. I'm uh, very pleased to be here, very pleased to have been um, allowed to come along. I'm a database analyst for Engine Yard. Um, I've been getting paid to play with computers for about 18 years now. Uh, I've been able to work on all kinds of fun stuff from embedded systems to supercomputers. And I figured that if I ever got a chance to come up here and talk to you all, it would be to impart some wisdom about database indexing, which as Rails developers you generally need to have imparted, um, or some similar topic like that. But when it came time to submit a talk proposal, I decided to submit two of them because there's another topic that I'm also quite passionate about, um, and that is cake decorating. Uh, <laughs> no, so um, yeah, really, I love my cakes. But uh, look, I want to make it clear. Um, I've I'm talking about depression. Uh, when I talk about depression, it's something that uh, affects lots of people in different ways, right? So it affects people individually. If I describe something that doesn't match up with what you're seeing, uh, what that means is that our experiences have been different. It doesn't mean that what I'm describing doesn't necessarily apply to you. So I want to talk, first of all, about what it means to be depressed. You know, we all have our ups and downs from time to time, but some downs last longer than others. And uh, there's a definition that a major depressive episode is a period of at least two weeks during which you've spent most of every day feeling depressed. And depression doesn't mean sad, right? They're not synonyms for each other. There are checklists of symptoms uh, across a whole range of areas, things that affect uh, not only your feelings, but things that can affect your behaviour, uh, things that affect your thoughts, things that can affect you physically. Um, for example, you know, enormous checklist. You can definitely be sad, right? You can be overwhelmed, uh, irritable, indecisive, lacking in confidence. Uh, you might have trouble concentrating. You might find that things that used to be fun just aren't fun anymore. You're doing something that you know you should enjoy and you just don't. You might stop going out, you might lose touch with friends, you might be drinking more or less productive, you might not be able to sleep, you um, suffer headaches, you lose your appetite. There's, there's a whole range of things and if you feel like this, you're definitely not alone. The Australian Bureau of Statistics uh, conducted, or they conduct regularly a, a national health survey and in 2012, the number they came up with was that 13.6% of the population are experiencing mental and behavioural conditions of which depression is the most common and anxiety was the second most common there. So that's at least one in 10 people in Australia. Um, 2.1 million people in this country alone, uh, that number is going up, it's gone up 4% over the past decade. There are 450 people in this room have a look around and, and think how many people right here are definitely statistically guaranteed to be going through this. I mean, I know I've talked to people and uh, that number I think is a lower bound because we're talking about a self-reporting survey. People who, when contacted, are willing to admit that yes, this is how I feel. But no definition, no amount of statistics can really prepare you for what it means to be depressed. And I want to tell you a story about how I first came to really understand what it means to be clinically depressed, to be recognised, diagnosed as, as suffering from a severe depression. And the story is this. When I was 19, I met a girl. Uh, we met online on IRC. And I'm so old now that meeting people on IRC was actually kind of weird back then. We did it before it was cool. We were dating hipsters, except it was the 90s, so we did it before they were even hipsters, right? She was smart, she's funny, we, we could and did talk for hours about anything. We lived in the same city, so we met up in real life, in meat space, and things progressed, you know, as they usually do. And early on in our relationship, she had told me that she'd been diagnosed with clinical depression. And like anyone, you know, she had her ups and downs. We'd talk our problems over with each other. My natural impulse when somebody tells me about a problem is that I want to solve that problem, right? She'd tell me how she was feeling and 
I would naturally respond by saying, well, you know what you can do about that, but you can try this, you can try that. I'd suggest some action she could take to change a situation she was unhappy with uh, or to feel better about something. You know, I'd try and help her take a step back, get some perspective, explain you know, things aren't as bad as they seem, you know, um, things are definitely going to get better. And sometimes we would talk and afterwards everything would be fine, problem solved. I found, though, that it was getting really difficult for me to predict whether or not my perception of, of how that discussion had gone uh, matched the reality, because there were days when I was convinced that we'd solved a problem, everything was great, and I'd realise that nothing had changed, she was really down again, and it was exactly the same problem. We weren't having any impact on that. There were times when I could look in her eyes and see that no matter what I said, no matter what she said, she simply couldn't believe that things were ever going to get any better. She could tell me exactly why and how things were going to, get, were going to improve from, from the plans that we'd come up with together, but she couldn't actually believe it. And the point at which I knew I really understood for the first time what was going on was she called me one night in tears and she told me that she'd just tried to kill herself. Uh, to cut a long story short, she ended up being committed uh, for a short stay in the psych ward at our local hospital. And I learned two very important lessons that day. I finally understood then what she meant when she said that she was clinically depressed. It meant that she couldn't talk her way out of that hole. It didn't mean being sad. She was certainly capable of joy and moments of humour, and anyone I've met who's suffered from depression um, has been the same. It's, it's not just sadness. Depression, as a word, barely scratches the surface of what it means to feel this way. And we've all been depressed at some point, some of us for longer periods than others, and many of us in ways that have had a concrete and negative impact on our relationships or our lives. But for most of us, we can still imagine a light at the end of the tunnel, even if we can't quite see it yet. We can hope that things are going to improve, things will get better. And to be clinically depressed is to lose that ability to hope for a brighter tomorrow. And we do have a word for that. Despair is the complete loss or absence of hope. And I think it's a, it's a better word to differentiate between depression and the end point of that journey for a lot of people. The other important lesson that I learned that day was that I truly understood what it meant to love someone. It means taking the good with the bad, you know, for better or for worse, even when you know that that bad is definitely on the horizon coming at you. I knew for certain that I really loved this girl and uh, that loving her meant accepting that this is just part of who she is. A couple of years after that, we were married. Uh, we had our 13th wedding anniversary a couple of weeks ago. And understanding despair was critical to the survival of our relationship, but more importantly than that, it's critical to the survival of my wife. Right? For her, this isn't something that's going to go away. She can't get over it. She can't just decide to feel better. She suffers from a chronic illness. Right? Sometimes things get better, sometimes things get worse. This is something, though, that we have to deal with together through hard work, through vigilance, and something we'll have to continue dealing with for the rest of our lives. It would be the same thing if my wife was a diabetic. It's something that we need to be constantly aware of, it's something which is dangerous if it's left untreated, it's something that she might need to take medication for every day. What it is not is the kind of thing that we should have to hide. Right? It is not the kind of thing that anyone should be ashamed of. Now, we as a community are getting a lot better, I think, at talking about depression and mental illness. Uh, in the past few years, it's been discussed much more often, more openly than before. We've had, aside from me here today, there have been talks at other recent conferences, uh, Alter Conference is one that I need to watch, 
Um, I think that we can even talk about issues like uh, imposter syndrome, as Josh talked about, you know, that all fit under an umbrella because sometimes it can be difficult to know uh, where that's coming from and, and where that fits into the story for an individual. But I think that many of us are at a severe disadvantage when it comes to understanding depression. Not only if we haven't experienced it ourselves, um, but even if we have and we're going through it personally. As I mentioned, as I mentioned, my initial reaction to my girlfriend telling me about her problems um, is that I want to try and solve them because that's what I do with problems. Right? I love problems. I love problems because you can break them down into smaller problems which are exactly like the problems you started with except now you've got more of them. <laughs> and the fun part is that when you make them small enough they stop even being problems, right? Or we call them tasks or maybe we call them bugs or maybe we call them features. Maybe we decide that that's not a problem we're really worried about anymore. But this sort of hyper-analytical deconstructive approach to problem solving in general is a pretty common reaction among this crowd, I'd, I'd be willing to bet. For most of us here, it wouldn't be too inaccurate to just swap out our job title with problem solver. You know, whether you're a developer or you're a sysadmin, maybe you're a lead architect, maybe you're a code wrangler or a DevOps ninja, we all solve problems professionally on a daily basis. I even had a client once send me a business card to sign. Um, he wanted some cards and I said, look, I don't have any cards. And he said, I can sort that out for you. I've got to give you a language warning for this. This is the only business card that I actually have for some reason. And uh, I'm, I don't give too many of these out for some reason. <laughs> I've got a lot spare, so if you want one, you know, hey, they're, they're free. So if the mage-like powers of being able to break down problems and fix them with nothing more than the power of your mind, if that's a core part of your identity, right, a core part of your job responsibility, it can make it really difficult to understand that there are some problems that can't be solved just by thinking about them. Right? It makes it really difficult for people to recognise that sort of problem when the thing that you use to solve problems, your brain, and something that you're really good at doing, that's the thing that you're having a problem with. I mean, you know, what do we do when we find a problem? You know, as geeks, as hackers, we write some code, right? Depression, yeah, there's an app for that. Right? There are multiple apps for that. Uh, some of them are great. You know, it's a great impulse to have. We want to use our technical skills to solve problems like this. Uh, this is MoodScope. It's a mood tracking app, like sort of a quantified self thing. Um, Smiling Mind is a mindfulness meditation app. A lot of people find that sort of thing helpful, an introspection way to, to figure out where they're going. But you know, this impulse um, is not always constructive. It can be quite destructive. We get carried away with thinking that, well, there's no problem we can't solve by writing some code. And things can backfire. The Samaritan's Radar app uh, was well-intentioned. They didn't want to hurt anyone. They created this without any thought for the real-world consequences. It's an app that allows you to nominate the Twitter handle of a friend that you might be worried about, and it will then go off and monitor their feed and alert you if they say things that it feels might indicate that they're suffering from depression or they're feeling suicidal. You know, I mean, this is a really noble goal to have, but we live in a world where perhaps not everyone who wants to monitor how somebody else is feeling and reacting to what's going on around them has their best intentions at heart. So tools can help, but we can't necessarily code ourselves out of this kind of hole. I've seen the pain and depression and helplessness in someone's eyes when they run up against feelings that they just can't think their way out of. People who can look at a problem, break it down, figure out a plan to deal with it, they can't bring themselves to believe that it's going to work. It's like at some level they know that it won't work. No matter how much their rational mind can explain that they've, they've broken this down, they've dealt with it. There's, it's 
this kind of depression is almost like a knowledge that things can't get better. And I want to talk to those people and tell them that they're wrong. I want to tell them before it's too late for them to hear and understand that message. The first time I stood up in front of people to talk about this topic was uh, a couple of years ago at a Blue Hackers BOF uh, Linux conf. And the reason I wanted to talk that day was because about a week beforehand I'd had a phone call from out of the blue from a friend of mine. I'm going to call him Pete because that's his name. But Pete had hit rock bottom. You know, I mean, I still wish that he'd called me earlier, but I'm so grateful that he called me when he did. I had to take him into hospital. Um, he's still with us today. In fact, by freak chance, we happened to be uh, in Melbourne at the same time. He's up the back somewhere there. I don't even remember the conversation that saved Pete's life. You know, some, some years beforehand, I'd said to Pete, he should call me if he ever needed help. And when Pete was feeling so low that he couldn't get any lower, when he was convinced that nobody cared and nobody would be willing to help him, he remembered that conversation and he called the only person who'd told him, I care and I will help, you should call me. The human brain is still the most complicated machine that we know of. You know, on the one hand, we're making huge strides in decoding it, understanding how it works, and on the other, we're, we're still pretty fuzzy on some implementation details of sort of key concepts like consciousness and agency. One thing that we do know is that it's self-modifying code. Right? The act of learning involves physical changes in the structure of your brain. I'm hacking your wetware right now. Right? And this is what you need to do for yourselves. But importantly, for the people that you care about, is you need to perform, not an SQL injection, you need to perform a knowledge injection. Sometime years before, I'd said to Pete that he should call me, and that information became part of the structure of his brain that was what it took to make a difference and to save a life. The, the single most important thing that you can do is to talk to your friends and family, talk to your colleagues, you know, tell, them, tell them that you care. Don't assume that they know how you feel. Tell them explicitly and make sure that when they're telling themselves that nobody cares, they have a chance of remembering that time when somebody said to them that they do. If you ever find yourself in that hole, I want you to remember that you need to tell someone. Right? You need to reach out and ask for help. And when, when you tell someone that they can call on you for help, it doesn't mean you're putting up your hand to be their doctor or to be their counsellor. It means you might be putting up your hand to call a doctor or a counsellor for them one day. I'm not a counsellor. If you call me, I will tell you that you need professional help. I will try to help you get it but I'll remind you that you're not alone and that someone does care. As individuals, you know, we can take these simple actions that can improve lives, possibly even save the lives of people around us, but we're more than individuals. You know, we're a community. This isn't the first time this slide has been up. You know, Matt's is nice and we are nice. And to have this kind of thing embedded as part of your culture is a privilege and an opportunity. Right? It's a guide whenever you need to make a decision. If there's more than one solution, pick the nicest one. Right? It's about compassion for people. And as a community, we embrace diversity, and even if we have a long way to go, I think we keep improving. We work to continue to improve, and part of that is recognising that if you or the people you work with are affected by depression or mental illness, then that's OK. Right? We each have an opportunity to make our workplaces and our community, one in which it's okay to be sick, it's okay to go and see a professional when you need help. I never really considered myself to be depressed. I've always thought of myself as a pretty cheerful kind of guy, but you know, I've, I've been through bouts of depression uh, since I was a teenager, sometimes for weeks, sometimes even for months at a time. 
I consider myself lucky because I was always able to do that thing that I was trying to encourage my wife to do. I was able to take that step back. I was able to make plans, um, work on fixing it, you know, when I felt like that. But I've got to tell you, the past year in particular, for no reason that I've been able to put my finger on, has been the hardest ever. You know, we, Josh talked about imposter syndrome. I've been doing this for a long time. I've never felt less capable than in the past year. And uh, it's easy when you know other people are in a worse place than you to think to yourself, get over yourself. You know, other people have got it worse. But while I was researching this talk, in fact, just last week, I decided, well, I should probably fill out one of these depression and anxiety checklists for myself, you know, I mean, for the first time. I'd never actually done that before. And this is what I came up with, right? I scored in the highest category. Um, to be fair, I scored at the bottom of the highest category, but we're still in to see your doctor if pain persists kind of territory, right? So I called. I made an appointment with my GP. He's busy, I'm busy, I won't get to see him until I get back. Maybe there's nothing to worry about, you know, but if any other part of my body was sick, I wouldn't hesitate to go to a doctor. Why make an exception for our minds? As a community, there are other things we can do as well. Uh, as I mentioned, I worked at Engine Yard a couple of years ago. I mean, I work at Engine Yard. A couple of years ago, um, Em and Leonard got up and spoke at an internal company meetup about how so many companies talk about wanting to make developers' lives easier, right? But what they really mean is they want to make their work lives easier. And that maybe there was something that we could do to make developers' whole lives easier. And uh, Engine Yard thought, hey, that's a great idea. They said, go for it. And uh, with generous support, we managed to create something called Prompt, uh, which is an organization that has the aim of having people from our community get up on stage like me today um, and talk about this topic. People who've been affected by depression, mental illness, I encourage you to check out the website, prompt.engineyard.com. Um, you might be thinking by now that uh, someone you know, uh, maybe yourself, someone in your life should get some help. And help might just mean opening up and talking about it. It might mean counselling, lifestyle changes, it might mean medication, it might mean some combination of all of the above. Beyond Blue here in Australia is a good place to start if you want to know where to go next. And I recommend you try the K10 anxiety and depression checklist for yourself. Uh, Blue Hackers is another great resource, again, community-based organisation here in Australia um, of the tech and open source community who are affected by depression and want to share their experiences and their approaches to dealing with it with each other. But I want to remind you of the single most important thing that I'd like you to take away from this talk, and that is to tell someone that you care about them and that they can call you if they ever need help. And please don't put this off. I want you to do this today, right? When you leave here today, give someone a call, drop in on a friend, right? The last thing I want you to remember is that you don't need to wait for that call if you know you need, you need help, right? You can tell someone if you need help. If it's not an emergency, call your GP, uh, call a friend. If you need immediate help, call Lifeline, call Triple O if you have to. If you just want to chat, you can get in touch with me, right? I will listen, I will help you find a professional to talk to. I want to thank the organisers for having me here today. Uh, this is a topic that's important to me, that I think is important to all of us, and I'm glad that they were in agreement with that. And uh, I'm really grateful for the opportunity to help bring this out into the open. I want to thank Engine Yard and Prompt, of course, for paying for me to be here. And I want to thank all of you for being willing to sit here and listen. So thank you.